Hi, my name's Pirat. I'm a trans person, but unlike a lot of the trans people that you'll see in the media and on YouTube, I'm not somebody who's in transition. I'm not somebody who's transitioned recently, and I've had a long time to settle into my identity. I transitioned 30 years ago, and today I'm just living my life, minding my own business. One of the things I've had concerns about, though, is that what you see in the media most of the time today is people who are in transition. I don't want to say it's an inaccurate representation. It isn't a complete representation. Think of high school, your senior year, when there's homecoming and there's prom, and all of it at the time seems so incredibly important. It's going to be the, the most important year of your life. But then afterwards, you move on with your life, and there's things like jobs and kids and family, and they're all much more important than that last year of high school. But at the time, it seems super important. For a trans person, that's what transition time is like. Time changes us as we develop into more complete and whole people, and as we settle into our genders and leave the transitional state behind. I thought for a while that perhaps somebody should make a video about this, and while I'm out here hiking, I thought maybe I should just get off my ass and do it. My purpose in making this video is to try to correct some of the misconceptions that are out there. I would like to inoculate sane people against the lies and misinformation that comes out of the right. I realize that the crazies cannot be reached, they are too far gone. But they are good at spreading their agenda, and I hope that by presenting a reasoned, sane argument, I can prevent them from infecting other people with their malicious nonsense. To balance it out, I am going to add some comments on where I think the trans and queer community uh, go a little too far. One of the things that's changed over the past 30 years is the numbers regarding incidents of transgender people. 30 years ago, we were estimated at 1 in 10,000 for transsexuals. These days, it's about 1%. That's a 100-fold increase, and that's an eye-opening number. Anti-trans activists often look at this and point at it as evidence that there must be something going on that, that we're doing to manipulate people into being trans, and I don't think that's the case. So I want to talk about this. What gives us a 100-fold increase in apparent incidence of trans people? One thing is the categorization, and I'm going to talk about how things were categorized 30 years ago, so I'm going to use some old terminology. Um, so trans activists, don't attack me because I'm using 30-year-old terminology. I'm talking about the past. 30 years ago, there were three categories. There were transsexuals, there were cross-dressers, and there were transvestites. That's how they, that's how they organized us. And the transsexuals were seen as, you know, really, I guess what you would call today, transgendered. Um, Crosschesters were seen as, well, they just did something on the weekend or uh, on the evenings for fun to relax or whatever, but they weren't really transgender in any way. Um, yeah, that, I shouldn't use the word transgender because that didn't exist back then. And then there were, you know, transvestites who did it, you know, put on women's clothes as some kind of turn on. But, but again, it was something they did, not something they were. It, it wasn't part of their identity. It was just uh, an activity they participated in. As I was trying to find my own place in the world, I explored some different groups, crossed some different circles, and some of the cross-dressers that I met said that, you know, if the world hadn't been so hard, if things had been a little bit different, they would have gone the transsexual route. And at the time, I probably dismissed them as, yeah, well, if you were serious, you'd have done it. But with retrospect, I, I think there's some truth to their stories that Maybe these categories overlapped more than we thought. With the advent of the term transgender and a lot of the modern terminology, we see a lot more blending of things. It isn't three clear pigeonholes invented by uh, some doctors so they could decide how to pathologize us in different ways. Julia Serrano and others have given us a vernacular that allows us to define ourselves in a way that is meaningful to us. It feels like it fits us. The new terminology overlaps and has an umbrella term that allows people to can redefine themselves without having to start again or jump from one category to the other. It's no big deal. There are also a lot more categories. You're not just trans or 
transvestite or crossdresser. Now you can be trans or bigender or gender fluid, third gender, agender. Uh, there are all kinds of categories that didn't exist before. I think that accounts for a lot of the growth in the trans community. One of the current concerns that anti-trans folk seem to be most worried about is just how easy it is to become trans. The idea seems to be that it goes something like this. Hey doc, uh, it, it's Pirette. Yeah, how you doing? Uh, yeah, doc, look, I, I was thinking that, um, I was thinking I might want to have a sex change. Uh, can I get in? Uh, oh, nothing today. Okay. Tomorrow, one o'clock? Okay, is there anything I need to do to prepare? All right, okay, eat nothing after five. Enema tonight at nine. And don't drink anything after 11 p.m. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll see you tomorrow at one then. Great. All right, thanks, Doc. See you tomorrow. That's completely unrealistic. So let's talk about what actually happens the first thing you need to do is find a therapist. No endocrinologist is going to give you hormones, and no surgeon is going to do anything until you've gotten some letters of recommendation. First, you need to search around and find somebody with the right credentials who specializes in gender-related therapy. They're hard to find. They usually have long queues, and when you finally get in to see them, you have to have a relationship for several months seeing them on a regular basis before they're going to write a letter of recommendation to get on hormones or hormone blockers. Once you finally get that, you've got to go find somebody who will prescribe the hormones. Also not easy. They also often have cues and wait lists. So once you finally get in with them, you can get on hormones. That does not enable you to get surgery. You need to continue the therapy for another year, at least. You have to live in your new role before you can get surgery for at least a year and see a therapist while you're doing it to make sure it's all going well. If you do all that, you can finally get in to see a surgeon. But the problem with surgeons is that that doesn't come easy either. They've all got wait lists, typically over a year. You're looking at years from the time you decide to transition to when you're having surgery. It is not an overnight process. So when you hear people talking crazy talk about going in and getting the chop, yeah, that doesn't happen. We know one person. She did not go to a reputable surgeon. The best we can figure is she went to some body modder who must have had maybe gone to some veterinarian school or gotten kicked out of med school or something and butchered her. If you're trans and you're thinking and you're frustrated with the process and you're thinking maybe you should do that, don't. It, it, the results are not good. There's also a lot to do outside the official process. Uh, for male to female people, for example, there's the process of getting rid of the beard, which requires months, maybe years of electrolysis, which is expensive, painful, and time-consuming. It is not a trivial overnight matter to change genders. It is a long slog and it has a lot of stepping stones along the way where if somebody is making a mistake, they have plenty of opportunity to see that and decide to change direction. So do I worry that maybe some of that hundredfold increase might be explained by trans tourists, people who think it might be so much fun and exciting to transition and be like all these other trans people that I'm going to give it a try just for fun. I, I, I can't imagine, imagine anyone would go that far down that road before realizing this is costly, a big hassle, a lot of times painful. Hello, little guy. Oh, I gotta, I gotta be visiting me. I can't imagine you go very far down this road um, just for fun without just getting frustrated with the hassles and give up. You have to be really committed. Do I think kids might do it? I think they might try, especially liberal parents might buffer kids from some of the uh, hassles. If they're open-minded, they might encourage a destination more than just the exploration with the misguided idea that there are anti-trans people out there and if my kid's going to have to deal with them, I should encourage my kid to be trans to offset that. Encourage the exploration, don't encourage the destination. Give the kid 
freedom to turn back if they want to. So what about the flip side? What about parents that are too strict? Well, I think that risks uh, trans kids committing suicide. Certainly the statistics bear that out. I think there's also the issue that the longer somebody is delayed once they know what they want to do, the more desperate they become, the greater the risks they will take to achieve their ends. And I would point to our friend that went to some out-of-the-system butcher to get it done, but at what cost? The more people are delayed, the less they consider what they want, the more focused they are on overcoming the hurdles that are put in their way. Allowing somebody to explore early and deeply, they will still have the ability to reflect and contemplate whether they are doing the wrong thing. The more they're delayed, the more they're focused on getting to their destination. Let's be clear. Children are not allowed to have surgery or go on hormones. All they get is therapy and support. Adolescents are allowed to go on hormone blockers. In time, as they grow into young adults, they may be allowed to go onto hormones. But in all cases, the standards of care are a lot more stringent than they are for adults. And providers are often a lot more careful and stringent than the standards. None of this is allowed without appropriate counseling. So there are all kinds of safeguards in place. This is not something that is done entirely recklessly as the right wing likes to claim. Other influences on the changing statistics of the trans community would be the 1980s AIDS epidemic, which wiped out a huge portion of gay men. Certainly not all of them were transgendered, but some portion may over time have decided they weren't so much gay as transgendered. They aren't there. Uh, they aren't there to be counted. The other poll would be all the trans kids who in the past have committed suicide. Um, they weren't welcome to be themselves and they thought they were better off dead. As things have improved, there have been more and more kids making it to older ages, so they get counted now. <sighs> Another thing that uh, might contribute to the hundredfold increase in apparent trans incidents is um, the right wing likes to say it must be us persuading or convincing people. I don't think it goes that far. On the other hand, I think the visibility of some of us has influenced other people to come out. I would point to an incident in the late 90s where I had a job interview with a guy at Xerox. Three years later, she came up to me on the street and told me how that interview had changed her life. If she had never met me, she would have never known what was possible. And seeing me living my life, having had the opportunity to interview me for a job, gave her the strength to pursue her own interests and try out things that she had previously discounted as impossible. Did we even talk about it in the interview? I don't think we did. I think just her seeing a strong, confident trans person interviewing for a job doing software, yeah. And she's the most um, sort of obvious of the bunch, but she's not the only one. Others I can specifically point to, probably a half dozen. And how many are there that I don't know about? How many people have seen me, never even talked to me, maybe read about me on the internet, um, read my journal, um, I thought, wow, this, this person's pretty amazing. If she, if she can do that, maybe I can do that too. Maybe this isn't as impossible as I previously thought. So there is no great trans conspiracy to convert everyone and their children to being trans. We just want to live our own lives and find happiness doing so. When you hear right-wing conspiracies about how we're going to convert everybody's kids. I think this is either just more conspiracy theory like QAnon and all the other crap that's come out the last few years, or possibly misunderstood information about historical mutilation of intersex kids by surgeons to make their genitalia conform to one of the two standard genders. That practice is deprecated 
It was done originally based on bad science from John Money, a researcher who claimed that gender was malleable and a learned behavior, not something innate. His famous case about uh, the John Joan twins was eventually lost to follow up according to him, and when somebody did follow up, it didn't turn out anywhere near as good as Money had alluded to. There was a great write-up in a late 90s version of Rolling Stone, if you want to know more about that. There are all kinds of words that describe our gender in our language that we use that aren't transgendered. Girl, woman, tomboy, girly girl, bitch, cunt. The new terminology that transgender people are creating to describe themselves. Non-binary, two-spirited, third gender, non-gender, agender. It's just a transversion of all those different words for man or woman, the subtleties that exist we're giving ourselves. Having good language is becoming important to distinguish the variety that we are. We're just trying to create what cisgender people already have. One of the current concerns I have about modern trans attitudes is the idea that it's not okay for people to ask us questions, that it's invasive or transphobic to ask us about our experiences. So I wanna to speak to trans people for a moment. Um, look, I don't think this is a helpful attitude for us to have. Instead of attacking people for asking us questions, maybe we should honestly answer them. We want people to understand us. And I think it's contradictory that we want people to understand us, but when they ask, some of us yell at them. Look, I, I understand it depends on the nature of the question. Sometimes there's the awkwardly asked, but you can tell it's a question somebody's not quite sure how to ask or, or they're afraid they're going to get yelled at. I'm not saying that the questions aren't invasive or awkward. I'm saying people need to start somewhere. We are still a rare commodity. It's not something you learn about every day. And let's face it, the information that's out there, especially in the mass media, is often the more flamboyant members, the people who stick out, the people who are going to make good television. That's not you, probably. You're probably just someone who wants to live their life. I think there's also value in answering questions um, individually. It opens that personal dialogue. People like that. And while you can send people off to read a book or... Um, find answers on the internet. Answering the questions helps them get to know you and see that you're a person. Maybe there's a little bit of objectiveness or inappropriateness to the question, but nevertheless, putting up with it allows them to begin to see you as more human and, and see that you're just a person trying to live their life. In time, they won't need to ask that question because they'll know you completely. Another good reason for answering the questions is that, having been answering them for 30 years, a whole hell of a lot of the people who have asked them the most invasive questions have turned out to be trans themselves. So if you're refusing to answer those questions, you may be doing a disservice to your own community. If you really don't want to answer people's questions, then answer them by pointing people in the direction of some resources where they can learn more. Don't read them the trans diatribe. Don't be an asshole. A lot of people already think we're a bunch of stuck-up bitches. Don't make it worse. If people are afraid to get to know us, they won't. And the problem of feeling excluded or misunderstood is going to continue. Maybe you're not the one who wants to answer the questions, but you don't have to turn people off from our whole community. Let people continue to have the openness to 
ask those questions, help them out by pointing them in the right direction. There are probably a lot of things I could rant and rave about in terms of the way the trans community and gay community do activism today. The youth today often just like to use cancel culture or just go out and yell and scream to interrupt somebody's presentation if they think the person is anti-trans. You see this all the time when you see videos on YouTube where Jordan Peterson is has come somewhere to speak and the trans community is shouting over him and somebody gets close enough to make a recording of him where he's talking about the importance of reasoned argument while we're in the background uh, shouting and, and being annoying. And it just makes us look like clowns. But I think back 30 years and I'm not sure my generation was any different. Wisdom and experience come from mistakes made, equipment broken, and time. The trans kids today have to build that wisdom for themselves. That's just a matter of time and experience has had. It's not something that can be taught. We can teach some skills, but you can't teach wisdom. As far as the gay community and the whole gay pride thing, I'll drop a link below to my website where I've written about how screwed up I think gay pride is. I think better messaging would be talking about liberty and equality. But that's a machine that it's got a lot of inertia. It's going to do what it's going to do, whether or not it makes any sense. Here in Rochester, our Pride Parade has furthermore been taken over by the Queer Merchants Association. And so it's not really a political thing. It's this celebration and it's turned into an opportunity for them to promote their businesses and sell swag in the form of more rainbow crap. Rainbow capitalism is the term you'll hear sometimes these days, or, uh, or pink washing. It is what it is. If we look historically at the success of the queer movement, it's a combination of rallies where there's noise and shouting to bring attention to an event and get us excited to continue the fight, but it's backed up with thinkers and speakers who argue for treating us fairly, that it's um, going back to first principles, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. That's how, in the past, the queer community got to where it is today. There's a time Christians of this country just wanted to shut the fuck up and go back in our box. First Amendment protected our speech. We had a right specified in our declaration to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And from there, you could build arguments up into something that became a rationed argument for letting us have our space in our lives and to stop persecuting all queer people. One of the ways I think I've best represented the trans community and reached the most people has been simply by living my life openly and honestly. Living in my neighborhood where I've been for 24 years my neighbors have had a chance to see that I mind my own business most of the time. If they need a hand with something, I'm glad to help. If they have a concern, they can bring it to me. I will attempt to address it. And if I run into them on the street while we're out on walks, I say hello. I think that represents us well in a way that you could not reach people through argument or even making videos like this on YouTube because a lot of people are not going to search this out. The only opportunity to reach them is by a per trans person just happening to be in their life. It's not just where I live, uh, I've seen the same thing at work. I've done a lot of jobs over the years, and generally people have known that I'm trans, maybe not right away, but word gets around. I don't go out of my way to hide it. And I think by doing my job, trying to do it well, trying to be polite to my coworkers, giving them a hand when they need a hand with something, and generally not making more work by doing a half-assed job, they've come to respect me as a co-worker, and therefore, uh, well, okay, I'm trans, but you know what? I'm an okay worker. So, I guess the trans part doesn't matter, right? Perhaps there's a few that are religious and uptight, but the vast majority seem to eventually decide, hey, it's no big deal. I think that's something that you will never get through certain kinds of activism. One of the hot-button issues recently is trans people in sports and whether we can let 
trans people be in various sporting things as their original gender or at all. It's fucked up that we think it's important who hits the ball and who wins the game. It is screwed up that if you hit a ball good, you might get a scholarship to your college. It doesn't depend on how good you do in your studies. It matters whether or not you can hit a ball. We have a lot more important things going on. We have wars and political problems and environmental problems and overpopulation and not enough housing. And yet we're hugely preoccupied with sports. I think the solution is not to worry whether or not trans people are in sports, it's to put sports back into their place. They are a game we play so we can get exercise. And if, you know, on the weekend you want to see some experts who are good at hitting the ball, knock it around, hey, great. If it entertains you, fine, who am I to say that's wrong? But at the end of the day, it's not important. The outcome is not important there are much more important things going on in the world. And the fact that we worry so much about trans people in sports comes out of this obsession we have out of sports. We should really go back and check our ideas about the importance of sports. Because I think if we remember that sports are just the games that they are, the whole trans people in sports it just doesn't matter. One ongoing social debate we have right now is when we should start respecting a trans person's new gender and pronouns. I am going to answer by way of explaining um, what I think the goal should be, and I think we can all agree on them. There are two big goals that I see. Number one, you want to make sure to minimize regret. People that go down the path and realize after the fact, ooh, I made a, a bad mistake and it's now at a point of being irreversible. And two, you want to get rid of gender dysphoria, the feeling of being conflicted or confused about a person's gender. So my answer is going to be based on how do you minimize those two and how do you get the best positive results? And so I guess there's three categories of results. We have success, we have failure, and we have the terrible. So I would define the success as either someone is trans and successfully makes a new life for themselves in a new gender, or somebody is not trans and successfully explores and realizes it's not for them, and for that reason, detransitions and goes back to their old life. Failure is the case where somebody detransitions prematurely. They may be trans, they may not, but their feeling of gender dysphoria, of conflict about their gender, is not resolved. And this means whether they're trans or not, it's still down in their soul being this nagging problem. And I think that means often later they're going to come back and revisit it. And because now they've wasted a bunch of time, they're going to be more desperate. They're going to be in a rush. They're going to be more goal focused. They're not going to be as careful or as introspective about whether or not it fits them. There is more chance of making mistakes in the desperation to fix the problem. So I think that's a dangerous thing. I think the terrifying is when somebody gets to the point that they move on to surgery and only after the fact realize that, uh, yeah, I shouldn't have done that. And I will say that most often from what I've seen, uh, comes from people who have conflicts between what they've done and what their religion says is allowable. I think internally they may, may really want it. it it's the conflict over their religion that says that they shouldn't. Yeah, it's a mess. So based on all that, I would say the best way to make sure everybody comes out with the minimal amount of risk and the best outcome is to respect pronouns, start using their new gender, 
their new pronoun, be respectful. For somebody that really is trans, you make their life easier. They move on to their new life and get there with the minimal amount of hassle. How is that a bad thing? You want to make people hurt for no good reason? You're a psycho. For somebody that is not destined to be trans or somebody that will have regret if they go down this road, by putting hurdles in their way, they might turn back, but then they're going to be left with a question. Or they might become determined to overcome the problems you create. And so they proceed on forcefully trying to overcome these objections that you're creating. And that's where you end up with sex change regret. So that's not a good outcome. And if they go back and they haven't actually made the internal assessment to determine, yeah, this isn't for me, they're going to try again later, more desperately, more risk. So that's a bad outcome. Respecting people's gender allows them to do their exploration as easily, as introspectfully as possible, so that there is the least amount of error, that there is the best shot of coming out of it with gender dysphoria removed, and either going forward to where they're supposed to be or going back to where they're supposed to be, and not returning to the limbo land of gender dysphoria. Everything I've talked about in this video is based on things I've experienced, things I've witnessed as I've lived the last 30 years and seen other people transition, but especially that last segment talking about how to minimize regretful conditions. That comes out of watching myself and a lot of other people transition. I have seen people detransition prematurely, and I've seen the wreckage as they're depressed and sad that this thing failed. They're still unhappy that an issue's unresolved. It's horrendous, but they couldn't make it through because family was unsupportive and jobs difficult. I've seen other people who detransitioned for a while and then retransitioned and made it through the second time. And in the end, they acknowledged that they didn't have the sports in the first place. They're happy they made it through, but they're regretful that years were lost in, in the delays. I've seen those who successfully made an exploration and decided to turn around. And after reverting to their original gender, were able to move on because they understood that being trans was not right for them but it required making a sincere exploration to its end and coming to the conclusion on their own. At least one of them was delayed for years by a mother who fought tooth and nail. This person tried for years to prove to mother that they were trans. And when mother finally turned her mind around, the person finally had a moment of reflection that this really wasn't the right thing for them. But as long as they had to fight mom, they couldn't see that. There's my own transition where the hurdles that were placed before me between doctors that were telling me I was a gay man and a transvestite and wasn't eligible for surgery in just one after the other. By the time I started finding the right doctors to work with, I was just so focused on making progress that I could have just gone off a cliff if this was the wrong thing for me. If the argument seems a bit contradictory, Remember that human beings aren't straightforward. How do you get a teenager to do something? Well, tell them they can't. How do you keep them from doing it? Tell them they have to. And it's not just teenagers. If you want to see people in denial, just look at the Republican Party with the last few election cycles. And you want hypocrisy, look at the Democrats. They desperately want to fix the housing inequality and income inequality, but not if it's going to change their property values or their stock market holdings. Wishful thinking, just look back at the Republicans. They continued subsidizing billionaires in hopes that somehow, finally, trickle-down economics are going to work. And the Democrats, with global warming, they want it fixed, but they want the corporations to do it. They don't want to have to change what they're doing. They don't want to have to use public transit or buy a smaller car. They don't want to be inconvenienced. That's for somebody else to fix. The whole human race is a mess of denial and self-deception. Look, I wish human beings were more 
straightforward and rational too. But we're not. We're not Vulcans. And despite all our contradictions, I've seen so many trans people freed of the problems of gender dysphoria, freed of the conflicts buried in their soul. They blossomed into amazing new lives, a combination of who they had been and somebody entirely new that smiled more, that seemed happier, more fulfilled out of life. That seems like a win to me. As for me, I transitioned 30 years ago. It was about 28 years ago, as of this recording, that I actually got surgery. And it probably took several years after that for me to fully blend in. It isn't an overnight process. It comes gradually. Affirmation surgery was a nice release from being under the thumb of the Harry Benjamin Association. Although I acknowledge good therapists can be helpful in resolving issues. I unfortunately had a lot of really crappy ones. A few good ones. I developed my tomboy side, started using more power tools, learning to use my hands. Maybe about three years after uh, moving on, I found my love of dance going out clubbing and I started growing my social skills there. And over the years since then, I've found how much I love hanging out with uh, naturists, that would be nudists for most of you, and uh, hanging out in hot tubs and saunas, because boy, those guys know how to be hedonists. I've had a few relationships. I had a long-term relationship with a man who's still in my life, and I have a wife now. I'm very blessed to have both of them. Affirmation surgery for me followed right after college, and after I'd recovered, I began my career. I took a lot of the income from that and used it to bootstrap my life. Ended up with a new car, getting my own apartment, no longer sharing space with friends. I regret that I didn't prioritize getting my beard cleared and getting rid of it. Because when I did finally put money into that, it just made a tremendous difference getting rid of something that reminded me of my past every day and always made me feel a little bit of an in-between. I think that was the final step where I put it all behind, behind me when I got that done and finished. I know that for third gender or non-binary folks, living in the middle is a happy place, and hey, that, if that works for you, great. I am happy to no longer be in that weird in-between state. I think that about wraps it up, so thank you for watching. I hope you learned something. Hopefully you think we're a little bit less crazy than what we've seen or heard in the media. Maybe learned we're a little more expensive than the two-dimensional cardboard characters you often see TV t teaching that we are. Um, I wish I could do a more perfect job. I wish I didn't trip over my words. I wish I enunciated better. I wish I could give my ideas better clarity, but yeah, <laughs> I'm human and I have my limitations and this thing I can only have so much time. I have said that I don't really identify as trans and I've got a lot of new interests. I have a software project I want to get back to. I want to get back to studying Nederlands. I'm reading my first book in Dutch. My first real book, anyway. Uh, I want to get in a bike ride today before it gets too cold and the rain comes. There's a lot of things I want to do. And I'm glad you took the time to make this, but yeah, I think it's just going to be a one-shot. If you want to leave comments down below, you're welcome to. I probably won't read them because I'm going to be moving on to other things that are interesting in my life. Cheerio, everyone. In fine dach.